Hello, you are listening to Stories of Scotland. Congratulations. Woo! <laughs> this is a podcast where we charge into the heritage and history of Scotland, yelling at the top of our lungs while trying desperately not to trip. I'm Jenny, an extra from Braveheart. And I'm Annie, somehow an archivist, <laughs> happily watching this battle charge from the nearby forest, surrounded by fairies and squibbles, all quietly having a picnic. <laughs> In this episode, we are further exploring Highland clan culture by taking a look and a listen to the different clans Sluig Yarim. The Sluig was the name given to the male population who were called to battle, the clan's army. And so the Sluig Yarim is Gaelic and it translates to war cry. Thus, the Sluig Yarim, like all war cries, was roared by the clansmen as they charged into battle, rushing towards potential death, claymores and plaids are flying. And the word that we use in English, slogan, that sleazy advertising term, <laughs> is actually derived from our Gaelic, Slug Yerim. So this phrase was the army's fighting slogan that their sleazy advertisers came up with. <laughs> And you'll sometimes see these war cries called slogans in English when the marketing department has been involved. <laughs> <laughs> but the Slurg Gerim often represents a physical place, a real location. It's not just a battle cry, but the Slurg Gerim is the rallying cry to gather the fighting force. And it's the place where the men would gather before battle. Down the pub! I think you find your slogan at the bottom of a glass of whiskey there, Jenny. Yes, and it burns going down. <laughs> Slange of ass. Slange of ass. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look at an example of a slurg gerim, a meeting place before war, and see what we can learn from it. Feuding and battles between clans and countries were very common, and so almost every clan has its own unique war cry. But which one shall we choose, Jenny? I've decided on Clan McNaughton. Ah, of course, the mighty McNaughtons. <laughs> of all the great clans, Jenny, what made you pick them? Well, I was trying to decide how to pick a clan, as there are, like you said, so many with great slogans. And I was thinking of all my favourite places in Scotland and one of my favourite spots to wild camp is on the shores of Loch Awe. And this is where the McNaughtons had their seat. Well, actually, their seat wasn't quite on the shores. See, the clan Sluig Hirim is Fruach Eilan. And this is the name of an island on Loch Awe. And this island was the seat of the mighty McNaughtons. Now, the seat of a clan is its physical centre, often the castle that the clan chief and his family live in. While the rest of the clan would be scattered about the surrounding area, the seat is where the decisions about the clan are made. It's the heart of the clan. But it's more than just the chief, it goes beyond him. See, a chief may last from one month to 60 years, but the seat of a clan? That spans for hundreds of years. And in doing so, it embodies the whole essence of the clan within it. And also, probably, a lot of secrets and ghosts. Woo! And it's where the clan gathers to be together. This war cry of Fruch Eilin isn't just some arbitrary, yet no doubt terrifying yell in the charge of battle. It's the ship of the clan's belonging, and they are anchored to the land. And many of the clan Sluig Yerims were a place of great importance to the clan. So Clan Morrison's Sluig Yerim is Dun Aishtin. The Morrisons were based on Lewis, and Dun Aishtin is a sea stack that is only accessible when the tide is low. This stack has incredible archaeological remains of large buildings. And these are all that is left of the seat of the Morrisons, a stronghold held from about the 1500s to the 1700s. But not all clan slogans are tied to the seat of the clan. 
Some of my favourites that aren't tied to the seat are Clan McLennan's, which is the Ridge of Tears. Okay, so it's very likely that this is actually a place of significance to the clan territory, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because what else could a Ridge of Tears be? It has to be a mountain ridge. Maybe one that has a lot of natural streams or springs or where something very tragic in clan history occurred and now it's remembered as a place of sorrow. Nah, I reckon the McLennan chief was just super in touch with his emotions. He would tear up all the time. And actually it got all the men as well really emotionally, you know, open and free. And they just cried all the time and it was great. And so they just, you know, a ridge of tears followed them. (laughs) Ah, the terrifying ridge of tears into battle. We'll drown you in our sorrow. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so what other slogans have you found, Jenny? Clan Camerons. This one's a really good one. Sons of the Hounds, come here and get flesh. So, Graham McTavish and Sam Hewen from Outlander love this war cry so much that they made it into a rhyme for the TV show that they made. (laughs) Okay. O sons of dogs, O dogs of the breed, come, come here on flesh to feed. How is that, Annie? Did I sound like, were you, did you feel like you're an outlander? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes, I feel like I've travelled through those standing stones. (laughs) (laughs) But my personal favourite that I found is Clan Kurs, which is late, but in earnest, which I just (laughs) love. (laughs) This is an excellent war cry, but there has to be some kind of story behind it. Yes, there is. So... The slogan was taken up after the Battle of Ancrum Moor in the winter of 1545. This was part of the War of the Rough Wooing. Let me tell you, Annie, I've had some rough wooings in my life. (laughs) Oh, Jenny, Jenny, too much information. Back to late but in earnest. (laughs) The English forces were invading the Scottish borders and the Kerrs, a lowland clan with many mighty mounted troops, initially sided with the English. But as the sun started to set, it began dazzling the English army, forcing them to really squint at their foes. And then the wind picked up and blew gunpowder and smoke into the English ranks. With the English partially blinded, it looked like the Scots were going to win. And so, in typical border clan style, the Kurds quickly changed sides and fought against the English, ensuring a victory for Scotland. And so they joined the Scottish side late, but in earnest. I mean, how earnest is that if you're turning coat (laughs) mid-battle? I don't know. My clan is also from the borders and we are famous, famous for just being wild potato-stealing flip-floppers. Classic Jenny. (laughs) But that's a great story. It is, it is. And finally, another favourite was Clan Maclean's, whose Sluag Yerim is the blunt yet accurate death or life. (laughs) 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 Which, I mean, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. (laughs) But the Maclean's have another one, which is another for Hector. Fer il erson echen. This is sad in memory of seven brothers of the Maclean clan who died trying to protect their clan chief, Hector, in the Battle of Inverkeething. I don't know if that is more light-hearted, Annie. It's basically just like, and another one for Hector. Oh, oh, no, he did, and another one, and another one. One mare, on you go. And then you're like, eh, oh, that was, that was a whole family. Eh, one more for Hector. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really sad when you say it like that. <laughs> right. And do you know do you know what those brothers were saying as they, they went in? They went, ah, well it's life or death, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it was death, it was death for all of them, unfortunately. <laughs> Any other fun slogans, Jenny? <laughs> um, no, no. And while these clans fighting slogans are tied to myths or legends or events in their clans, for the McNaughtons and many others, right before waging war upon a fearsome enemy the clansmen would draw on the strength gained from the ties to home, community, land, kinship, and survival. And together, they'd all bellow the clan's sluag yerem. And by conjuring this terrifying battle cry, the men are filled with a desire to fight harder, 
because they are reminded that they aren't just fighting for themselves or their chief, but for the piece of land that provides them and those they love safety, sustenance and society. They're fighting for the land that ties their clan together. So let's get back to Fuch Eilin. How did this become the seat of the Clan McNaughton? Ah, so this island is well situated at the north of the stunning Loch Awe and has been in the McNaughton family since King Alexander III granted it to the clan chief in 1267. So on one level, the battle cry of Fuch Eilin is commemorating this royal right to the land that goes back to the 13th century, which granted the McNaughton family the island and the castle upon it. But the clan has further royal ties that it is exceedingly proud of. The McNaughtons trace their family all the way back to the Picts. However, we view these kind of stories through a similar lens to the clans who are claiming ancestry from Irish mythology or kings, but it's great fun. The Picts occupied the north of Scotland from late antiquity to the early Middle Ages, and they are famed for their stunningly intricate Celtic carved stones. By claiming these links to ancient leaders, clans are asserting their power through lineage. Now, my Pictish isn't great, so forgive me for my pronunciation, but we have one Pictish king called Nechten and Dele, and he was a successful warrior and a king who then abdicated to become a monk, but then became a warrior monk and became king again. I think I've seen this Nicolas Cage film, and you know what? It wasn't one of his worst. <laughs> <laughs> And it's this Pictish king's descendants that, over the following centuries, became the McNaughtons. Oof, descended from royal warrior monk king Pictish blood? That is quite the origin story. <clears throat> well, there's not actually any evidence at all that Pictish king necked in Anderley. Anderley, Anderley! <laughs> that, was, that was his slew of your name. <laughs> Well, he had a great slogan, but he had no surviving children. Ah. So perhaps along the centuries at some point, a McNaughton bard just became a little bit inspired, came up with some fake news, it becomes fake history, and made up the story to make them seem a little bit more powerful. Or maybe he knew secrets that we did not know, and... The McNaughtons truly are the descendants of Pictish King, Nechton and Dele. <laughs> well, you know what? My clan are actually descendants of the first real haggis. Regal. Regal, Jenny. Yes. <laughs> I always wondered what that smell was, Jenny. Awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> anyway, what's interesting with a lot of the ancient clans is that the further you look back through their history, the more we see these semi-verifiable accounts blending with mythology and this results in the creation of rich family legends. And Fuch Eilin holds just such a similar legend for this clan. Now some folks translate Fuch Eilin as the island of Heather. However, others believe this to be incorrect and think it should be translated as the Isle of Fuch. Yeah, forget the Heather. Farouk has a much better tale tied to him than the shin-high woody shrub that covers 98% of Scotland, including most of the streets in Inverness. For way back, when dragons still cut about the skies and freddos were 5p, a nobleman of great stature had a son of great posture, and his name was Farouk. And Farouk was a prime example of ye olde hottie. That he was, Jenny. I found this marvellous description of Fuch from the Record of Argyll by Lord Archibald Campbell, written in 1885. However, bear in mind that Fuch is an ancient Irish hero of the Ulster Cycle, so there's a lot of fantasising in this description to come. <clears throat> in stature, he was tall, broad and strong. His hair was black, fine and glossy, like raven's plumage smoothed on snow. His eyes were bluer than the slow of a rock, his cheeks 
were redder than the blood of the fawn, and his lips, and his lips were more ruby than the raspberry of the hill, while his teeth were whiter than chalk. His skin was fairer than the snow and softer than the foam, and his voice was more melodious than the sweet tones of the harp. Fruch was a generous distributor of good. His spear was longer than a guiding pole, if you know what I mean. He was famed in battle, and his shield was broader and stronger than a door, while victory smiled upon him as her child wherever he went. Dang, someone get me a magic stone. I gotta outlander myself back into this guy's rippling arms. Uh, Jenny, may I remind you that no such stone is needed as you are besmitten with your girlfriend. Yeah, and judging by that bit of writing, Lord Archibald Campbell was besmitten with froch. <laughs> <laughs> but for as good looking as froch was, he was also loyal. And he was deeply in love with the only daughter of Meave. She was the fairest maiden of all of Argyle, and they were a match made in Disney heaven. However, Meave herself was also in love with her daughter's beau. This is like real Housewives of Argyle material. Just wait until they get to the tax evasion bit, Annie. It gets wild. <laughs> but, but before that, so desperately in love with Froch was Meave, and so unreciprocated was this love that it curdled to hate. And if Meave couldn't have Froch, then no one could, especially not her smoking hot daughter. This hatred led Meave to do what any reasonable mother would do and plot to kill Fruch. And so she concocted an ominous plan. At this time, it was well known throughout the Highlands that there was an island on Loch Awe, and on that island there was a rowan tree that bore fruit sweeter than honey, and this fruit would abate hunger for three days. But, more importantly, when this fruit was consumed, it turned back the ticking hands of time, bringing youth to whomever consumed it. Ah, this magic fruit sounds too good to be true. What's the catch, Jenny? Dragons! Well, one dragon, but a big terrifying one that slept curled around the base of the tree and would blast any potential fruit poacher to ashes if they dared attempt to take from the tree. Okay. So we've got a dreamy hero, a bitter mother-in-law, and some magical fruit, Mm. and a dragon. (laughs) What happens next, Jenny? (laughs) Please tell me it's not more sound effects. I'm just going to tell the rest of the story in sound effects, actually, and you have to kind of just like close your eyes and imagine. (laughs) (laughs) Well, next, Meave puts her devilish plan into action. She feigned an illness so terrible, it was as if her innards were writhing with snakes. In her fake agony, she called for Fruch and told him that if she did not consume the fruit of the rowan tree, then she would surely die. And that if she died, her daughter's heart would be so broken that she could no longer love him. Fruch understood the dangers of the task, and yet he went anyway. For his fair maiden's love... He swam to the island, and in the dead of night, managed to sneak three fruit from the tree without disturbing the slumbering beast. (laughs) On yourself, Fruch. But alas, Meave was not happy with his return or his offering, and so she upped the stakes and demanded not just the fruit, but the whole tree, roots and all. Despite knowing that he would die, Fruch accepted the task, as a man as bold as he could never turn from danger. Once more he swam to the island, and he tricked the dragon into uncurling from the tree. With his speed and strength, he tore the rowan tree from the earth and hastily bolted back to the waters. But this time, the dragon was having none of it and flew over him, landing in front of him and blocking his way to the shore. It was to be a battle. But as he was holding onto the tree with one hand, Fruch could not fight the beast properly, and so he was dealt some horrible blows. But lo, his lover was on the shore, and she threw him a knife of gold. With this, Fruch was able to attack back. He struck with deadly accuracy and force, killing the dragon. However, his own wounds were deep, and he too died. 
The warrior and the dragon lay on the shores of Lochaw, and the beautiful maiden fell in despair to Frugh's side. Distraught, she wailed his lament before collapsing onto his chest, where she too died of a broken heart. And that, Annie, is how Frugh Elan got its name, and also how Meeve killed her son-in-law, a daughter, and a dragon. Romeo and Juliet eat your heart out. Right? Even Baz Lernum's version didn't have dragons. I also read a version of this story where instead of a dragon, it's a giant snake. And instead of leaving the snake to sleep happily, Fruch just tears out its heart. That's interesting because there's also a myth of Lochaw that there's a giant snake slash centipede creature with lots of legs or no legs, depending on what you read, that lives in the loch. So... It's interesting to see how they all intertwine. Intertwine in a strange dragon, snake, centipede, loch creature of my nightmares. But this tale also explains why the island is sometimes referred to as the Hesperides of the Highlands, as the Greek myth of Hesperides also involves a tree with magical fruits. Jenny, I did not know you knew Greek. So wise, so smart. We were clearly in the correct category for the British Podcast Awards. Just a shame we didn't win. <laughs> I think what we do need is more Greek in the podcast. That'll probably get us get us it next year. <laughs> but this is a story of mythological wonder. And for the folks of Clan McNaughton, it's something very special to have these legends and myths that is special to their clan and kinship. That to be in a clan is to have these stories that are unique to your family and community. From the tragic love of Fruch that ends in death to the incredible dragon snake creature that also ends in death. It's quite the claim to ancient fame, isn't it, Jenny? It is, and drawing on that connection as you charge into battle, screaming the name of the patch of land that ties you to every one of your ancestors before you, all the way to the time of dragons. That's got to give you some extra level of confidence. Well, if Fruch can fight a dragon, you can fight the clan threatening your turf, no problem, Jenny. Yep, and next time someone breaks the ancient Highland law of not waving thanks to you as you've let them pass on a single track road, I will draw upon the ancient power of a handsome dragon-slaying hero to just carry on my way with a scowl on my face. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent, Jenny, excellent. Even further back than the tragic love story of Fruch and the dragon, Loch Awe was believed to be formed by a god herself. Yes, the Loch was created when the Kayach, our favourite old hag deity of nature and the environment, was atop the mighty Ben Cruachan, one of the finest mountains in all of Scotland. She was up there fetching water from one of her magical springs. She'd cover the spring with a stone at sundown and remove it at dawn. However, when she went up this evening to cover the spring, she got distracted by the stunning views and was carried off to sleep on their gentle waves of awe. When she awoke some time later, she was horrified to see that the spring had overflowed throughout the night. The water had gushed and cascaded and flowed in torrents down to the glen below. So much water had been released from her magical well that the whole glen was flooded, and lo, she looked down on the newly formed Loch Awe. But she didn't mean for this loch to be here, and in fact was horribly embarrassed that her mistakes should cause such an obvious new change to the landscape. What would the neighbours think? Her shame and humiliation was so strong and so deep that she turned to stone right where she stood. And this standing stone can still be found today, looking out over Glen Etiv and Loch Awe, the kayak forever petrified for her mistake. Oh, our dear kayak evidently found this event emotionally overwhelming, but I mean, it's a lovely loch. I'd be quite proud if I'd fallen asleep and woke up to make such a lovely loch. 
<laughs> I've done much worse things in my sleep. <laughs> But many folks who visit this tranquil body of water find it emotionally overwhelming in a very different way, hopefully in a positive way. The tall, imposing mountains are softened by deep forests creeping up their sides and running throughout the glen. The long and thin loch splits the glen, creating a place that has cradled life for thousands of years. And perhaps it's this birthing from a magical well that makes the loch and surrounding mountains and forests so mythologically dense. From child-stealing fairies to shadow men, shape-shifting fawns and of course ghosts, this spot in Scotland has so much mythology tied to it. It seems only natural that its creation was steeped in the actions of an emotionally overwhelmed deity. And it feels natural that a clan would choose this marvellous loch as their seat as Clan McNaughton did. I mean, the clan have wrapped their legends around it. The very waters of the loch, surrounding them and protecting them, were created, albeit by accident, by the mighty Kaliach. I'll happily channel the emotionally overwhelmed stone god lady as I charge into battle. It's either that or my deep frustration over the Highland housing crisis. Either or will do. But... Personally, I feel more people should embrace the Sluig Garim in the modern world. We can look at them not merely as war cries, said in the onslaught of battle, but more broadly as rallying and gathering ties that give a clan a sense of identity. We find clan values in the Sluig Garim, be it their bravery, Clan McNeil, victory or death! Or their connection to ancient kings and legends. Clan McAlpin, remember the death of a plane. He's our great, 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 great grandpa. Or most commonly, as we've been discussing, a place of great importance to the clan. Clan McLaren's, the boar's rock. Oh, he's a nasty big boar rock with big bristly boar rocky legs and we all know where this is going he's got a big muscly boar rocky boulder and shoulders and he's a big aggressive bouldery boar snout just oh another one of the boars we all know <laughs> <laughs> and they show us how important the land and the environment are to the clans it's up there as one of the central aspects of how they define themselves a place where they gather or a mountain that stands over them, or a loch that's just got lots of magic happening in it. The collective identity of the clan is centred on place as much as any of their lineage or characteristics. So in the days before facing battle, when men are gathering for what could be their last hours alive with their clan, their family and their kinship, they meet at the key point of their collective territory. And their last words before battle, which could be the last words that they will ever speak, are the name of the place that they come from. Because people and land are so inextricably linked that to fight for the land is to fight for the clan, to be fighting for your family. And I think this ties in so strongly to what we were discussing in the last episode of Duchess. That heritage is not something simple. It's something between the land and the people and all of the meanings that you have in there. Anyway, Jenny, what would our slug gave him be? What's the Gaelic for protect the Prosecco? Gianam Prosecco! Gianam Prosecco! <laughs> I find the Slurg Garim really culturally important and intriguing. A war cry so ferocious that it not only shakes the enemy to the bone but also strengthens the hearts and the minds of the warriors who are roaring it as they hurtle towards combat. And for us, I think the combat is over for today, Jenny. 
It is, it is. And so thank you all so much for listening to us yelling at you from afar. We had a wonderful time at the weekend at the Great British Podcast Awards down in London. Uh, As Annie said earlier, we unfortunately didn't win. But again, we just want to thank you all so much for tuning in to every episode, for sharing us, for giving us a like and a review whenever you can. It really, really helps. And for us to be this small independent podcast from the Highlands down in London with some of the biggest podcasts, not only in Great Britain, but also the world was really, really amazing. And it wouldn't have been possible without you guys. So thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of our listeners. We're so privileged that you put such trust in us to bring to you the wonderful Scottish heritage stories that we do. And we absolutely love doing it. We put time, care, extensive research into every episode. If you would like to support us as we research, write, record, edit and release this podcast, you can join our We Patreon family. We have a few new members, so a big Highland hearty welcome to Hanya, Mary, Jessica and Tyler, Jens, Stina and Amy. Thank you guys all so much. We are approaching almost 100 patrons on our Patreon, which is wild. And I'm trying to convince Annie to let us send you all shiny stickers when we get there. So if you want to join our Patreon and get a shiny sticker, then you can find us at www.patreon slash stories of Scotland. All right. Thank you all so much for supporting and listening along to our Highland tales. Slangeva. Slangeva. Slangeva.